Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, to the Fall 2022 MSN APRN Admissions Information Session. My name is Mark Coven. I am the Director for Recruitment, Outreach, and Admission. And you'll see here in the panel, you'll have uh, my, my A team, is what I like to call it. So you'll see Natalie Asensio, and then you'll also see Jamie Gama. We also have one of our faculty members here, um, Dr. Nancy Pike, but she will be joining on with us in about 15 minutes or so, along with a couple of our other uh, faculty members. Um, but again, just wanna say welcome. And just so you guys know, the purpose of today's session um, is to share our specific information that we have regarding our post licensure programs. So uh, here at UCLA, we love to use acronyms. Um, and so the MSN does stand for the Master of Science in Nursing. And the should say APRN, uh, which is here, which is the Advanced Practice Registered Nurse. Throughout the session, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to use uh, the Q&A. Uh, we might have disabled the chat, um, but if we haven't, please use the Q&A because that's what we're gonna be using in terms of answering your questions. All right. Okay, so here's for today's agenda. So I'll continue on with the introduction and then I'll go over the overview of the APRN curriculum. And then like I was stating earlier, we will have uh, faculty who will come and talk about the different specialties that we have and give brief descriptions on those. And then we're gonna open it up for some Q and A so you guys can ask them specific questions that they can help answer for you. I think those two sections are probably the most important part um, of this information session because you get to hear all the great things actually come from our faculty members. And then we'll go ahead and move forward with our um, admissions. And we're gonna break down the application and how to apply. And then we're gonna have our Director of Financial Aid, um, Yoni Thomas is gonna come and she's gonna break down some information that we feel is important for you guys as well. And then we're just gonna go ahead and close it out with any uh, remaining questions that you guys have. Um, and so, yeah, hold on for about two hours or so, but please feel free to log off, log back in if you need to, uh, but we will be here for you. Okay, so why UCLA? Um, we're a small community within a big city, right? So if you're thinking about UCLA, in general, if you guys are familiar with the campus or the location, UCLA is what we like to say a small community within a big uh, Los Angeles County, right? And so the same could be said within the School of Nursing, if you're thinking um, in the location of UCLA, right? We are, we are a pretty small program, I guess you could say. We have about 600 students in total. And that ranges from our undergraduates all the, all the way to our graduate programs. So what we like to say is we're our own small community within the UCLA campus. Um, and with that, um, we are ranked as one of the top nursing schools. That is something that we pride ourselves on and something that we're really excited about. Um, and so every year uh, we are part of that. And so um, it is, it's, it's great news on, on our end. Um, one thing that's on my mind, I don't see it in the slide, um, but in terms of talking about being a small community, we have a lot of resources for our students um, to make sure that they are successful and that they will um, move through with the program and be successful in terms of graduating. Um, and with that, we have a mentorship program that we put together. So you guys, when you come in as a first year MSN student, what we do is we like to partner you up with a second year, someone that's in your cohort. So that way they can be your mentor and they can help you, you know, guide you, give you some ins and outs and tips as you move forward throughout the program. Of course, you will have your own faculty advisor as well, um, but we also have one of our other partners in the student affairs office. Her name is Stephanie Dominic, and she would be your student service coordinator. So she meets with you quarterly and helps you throughout your progression throughout the program. Again, as I stated, we have our own um, financial aid office in the School of Nursing, so that's really cool, meaning you're not gonna have to go to upper campus um, and do that as well, right? So we have a lot of things um, in terms of what you need in order to succeed. Uh, what you'll see here is that our programs are specialty oriented, meaning that when you do apply, you will have to apply to a specific uh, specialty or to a specialty, I should say. Um, so there's no um, generic MSN. And so we will go over those specialties as well. And knowing that our graduates will be able to sit once they complete their MSN for the national certification exam. And so the last one you'll see here is we have outstanding clinical partnerships throughout Los Angeles and even depending on where you live. And we like to put that part because we even had students who live in the OC, right? So in the Orange County area, or even as farther down as um, San Diego. Um, and so um, we are able to have our clinical partnerships down there as well. So 
if there's any reason why you live there, um, you would have to come up and drive for you know the lectures and the classes. But in terms of the clinical rotations, we try to do our best to partner you up with that. And hold on a quick second, because I should be spotlighted. And I want to make sure I can go ahead and do that. Let me just figure out how you do that with all these controls here. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so I think I'm having some trouble with that. So I'm going to continue on and I will try to get that fixed for you guys. Okay, so we're going to go over the curriculum um, re really fast in the outline of the program. So again, all of our specialties are full time. And so when you're thinking full time, um, you're going to think that we have a set curriculum, right? And so we'll go over into this next couple of slides, but as you'll see, there are set days and set times in terms of where you'll have to come to class. Um, the same will be said for your clinical rotations. Um, those can vary on different days, but just knowing that it's a little bit different maybe from your undergrad where you get to kind of pick and choose your classes in the different times. It doesn't work like that for our Emerson program. Um, and so it is full time and then it, the classes are set in a sense. Um, as you see here, it says no line options available, um, but for the last year, about year and a half, we were remotely online due to pandemic. Uh, but this upcoming fall, um, some class, well, some classes will be moving back to in-person. Again, the university and the campus is opening up, um, but again, um, we're, we're kind of doing it like in phases. So at some point, probably by the time we get into maybe winter quarter or spring, uh, we will be moving totally back to in-person, going back to our traditional ways. Um, like I was stating before, specific days for our classes. And then if you're thinking uh, for the theory classes, they are typically on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And then again, the clinical days will vary. Excuse me for the background noise as well, if you do hear that. And so really fast for time commitment. I know you guys are probably used to, uh, to this, depending on the different universities and colleges that you attended. But what UCLA likes to say is for each unit that you're taking, they want you to dedicate at least three hours of classroom work, okay? So for instance, if you're taking 14 units in a quarter, they're saying we want you to dedicate at least 42 hours of that studying within inside or outside the classroom. Of course, you know yourself, so you may have to devote more time or less time, um, but of course, it's gonna be up to you to make sure that you're doing what you have to do in order to succeed. But of course, we have so many resources along with that as well. So what does a typical APRN student look like? Um, it's very diverse, right? So you'll see just for now, we just kind of have what the average age is, is. And so it's anywhere between 24 to 50 plus. And so there's not really an average or there's no minimum there, but it will tell you um, that we admit students no matter the age. That's really not something that uh, we look for in terms of the admissions, um, but people do like to get a breakdown. And so for right now, we have 82, we have a total of 92 students actually coming in um, this fall. And so there's a breakdown of the genders. But I think what's the most important part is what you'll actually wanna see is the clinical experience. So as you see, the more clinical experience that you have, the more competitive your application would be. So if anything that you see or you take from this, um, this page here, it's gonna be the more experience you have, typically the more competitive you would be. Uh, again, we will have another faculty member join us. And so if you have questions about any type of clinical experience that you do have that is related to your specialty of interest, please feel free to ask that. Okay, so in terms of the different specialties that we have, uh, you will see that we offer the adult juror acute care for the CNS, for the NP or the dual. And so the, um, the total here are the amount of students that we would like to admit per year, okay? So we can admit up to 40 students for the adult juror acute care. And for the adult juror uh, primary, we can have a total of 30 with our goal of bringing in um, NP at 20. And then for those that are interested in the occupational health focus, we can admit up to 10. So having a total of 30. For our PEDS, we have a total of 22. And you'll see the different variety of the specialties that we offer. And Dr. Nancy Pike will definitely be able to go over those. 
Um, and then we will finish that up with our family NP with a total of 40 um, with our newly added occupational health focus to that as well. And so I know sometimes people ask questions in terms of the total amount, especially if you're thinking about PEDS, right, and the different specialties that are offered within that. It's a total of 22. So we're not looking to admit, you know, eight for the pediatric nurse practitioner or dual primary, primary care acute care. Um, we can have one for that. And then we can have the rest of the 21 students coming from the other specialties and vice versa. So the goal is to really bring in the total amount of students. Okay, so for those that are thinking about getting into a dual certification, right, so you think it's the combined CNS and NP. Um, again, it's going to be about 1,000 hours or plus um, or a little bit less. It does depend on the specialty, but again, our faculty will be able to go over that. But for the CNS, typically that will happen during your summer, right? And so, um, as you'll know, our program is two years. You do your first year, and then typically if you're not thinking about doing a dual, then you'll be able to have that summer off. Right, and then you'll continue on with your second year. Um, but you will have to do the CNS during the summer if you are thinking about doing a dual. We think it's a great opportunity and a great option for you, especially if, if you know, you're thinking you may be on the fence for one of the two, if it's a CNS or NP, we would typically recommend you go ahead and get in the dual. Because one thing is, let's say you go ahead and complete your NP, and then later down the line, maybe a year, a couple of years later, you're thinking you wanna go back to your CNS. You wouldn't be able to do that here at UCLA um, just because we don't offer a postmaster certification. And then depending on what program, if it's at another, another university, you are most likely gonna have to do more, right, than just a summer quarter. So it's always best to just knock that out and you can get it all done within two years. Okay, so really fast, I think I have a couple more slides left. So our minimum GPA is gonna be a 3.0 and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the admission requirement but the minimum GPA is gonna be cumulative and it's gonna come from your, your um, undergraduate degree. If there's any of you that have two degrees, two undergraduate degrees, that's okay. Um, in the School of Nursing, we will look at the BSN. Okay, so we're looking for a minimum GPA of a 3.0. Uh, let me move this over so I can see how much can I work. Okay, so uh, as we know, you guys are all gonna be working um, RNs. Um, one thing that we always recommend is that you do not work full-time because remember, this is a full-time program, okay? So we do know um, that life happens and that you guys may have families or whatever the case is and have to take care of yourself. We do know that. So we do have students that work part-time or even per diem, um, but we do want you guys to make sure that your focus is on the education first. Um, how often do I come to UCLA? We kind of stated that a little bit earlier, right? So you're thinking that you will be coming at least uh, two days throughout your first year, which is Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, the second year does drop down, um, but again, that's not including the times you may want to come to class. I'm sorry, you want to come to campus to study, study groups and all that sort of thing. So just, just know that you want to be flexible as you're a student. Um, and then the clinical rotations, they are offered, but they will be on different days as well. So our program is BRN and CCNE approved, so that is something that we're really excited about. Uh, we just had our approval and we're already for the CCNE and we're already working on the BRN next. Um, and yes, you can sit for the, for the national certification. So that is something that is really key. If you're thinking about other programs, you wanna make sure that you're looking at their accreditation and that you're making sure that you will be able to sit for the national certification. So really fast, this is what the breakdown is gonna be. Um, if you are thinking about coming, so first year, um, you're gonna be thinking about two days, right? So winter, two to three days, two to three days as you're moving forward, right? And so you're thinking a day or two for classes and then another day or two for your clinicals. And then again, if you're thinking about coming um, or I should say doing a uh, dual program, remember that typically will happen during the summer. And then you'll start your last year and the days go down a little bit more. So you'd be thinking about one to two days and then you'll finish up spring quarter. You'll complete the comp and then you'll go ahead and graduate. So. Um, as you guys know, your undergraduate career went by really fast. Those four years goes by fast. The same thing happens um, even for the graduate level. The two years really do go by fast. Okay, so without further ado, because I want to make sure that we are giving our faculty enough time, um, I want to first, so I see here, introduce Dr. Wendy Robbins, and she's going to talk about our adult juro uh, primary, as long as as well as I should say the occupant occupational and environmental health. So without further ado, Dr. Robbins, take it away. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okie dokie. 
So um, it's great to be here to represent the Occupational and Environmental Health Nursing Specialty. And this is an advanced practice nursing role um, that encompasses all aspects of uh, work and health. Um, it's caring for workers and their families. And um, the this occurs in many different industries and types of settings. Um, for example, um, our students, uh, graduates are working at Amgen, Disneyland, Sony, Berry Farms up north, um, hospital employee health, urgent care clinics, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever you think of where people work, um, you can consider that um, that you would find an occupational and environmental health nurse there caring for their health. So what does it involve? Well, it involves an extra 10 units of study while you're in your program. And uh, the 10 units are generally taken in the School of Public Health, um, although they can be taken in social welfare and other places as well. But um, these uh, units plus a specialty occupational health nursing course, uh, learning about role and theory. Um, and that's what's involved additionally in the specialty. You will share some of your uh, clinical rotations, insights, occupational health setting sites. Um, and so you say, well, What's involved with occupational health? Well, it can be a lot of different things, but um, there is now a lot of emphasis on work stress um, and uh, also on uh, work and family, the relationship between uh, work and fertility and work and family is, is a big part of the role now. Um, and did I tell you who, who could uh, actually be in this specialty? The adult GERO primary um, and the um, family nurse practitioner uh, are the main students who uh, engage in the occupational health um, specialty. Uh, but we do um, encourage students who might be interested in the um, uh, role to take the summer course we teach about occupational health nursing as an elective. And we've had um, students from the pediatric programs and the acute care nurse practitioner programs take that course. And one thing we all realize is that the patients that you see, no matter what your specialty area, um, many times, you know, most people work. And many times, even though we don't realize it, um, the, the things that you're seeing, the um, neurogenerative things, the um, uh, cardiac uh, patients, um, work is involved in there someplace. And so um, I would encourage you to think about that because work we know is a social determinant of health. And it, it um, is everywhere when we look at health care. Questions? Are, do we take questions? We'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll let uh, the next two faculty members go and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. So next, uh oh, let me go backwards. Ah, sorry guys. Okay, so next I would like to introduce Dr. Nancy Pike and she's gonna talk about our pediatric program. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the pediatric APRN subspecialties that we have. There was a bit of an exhaustive list that uh, Mike sh or Mark showed you on the previous slide. But for the most part, our students typically fall into three of those specialties. And one is our straight primary care PNP program. And then our most popular options are our dual options. 
And the first one uh, that is the most popular is our primary care and acute care PNP uh, program or track. And this is the, the first of its kind in uh, towards the West Coast. Um, this is a very popular uh, program that's out on the East Course. There's a lot of them coming at the top universities. And our program has now been going for two or going on our third year of this. And we graduated our first cohort last uh, or this past June uh, from that program. And your first year is primary care, and then you build upon those skills and you do your second year in acute care uh, pediatrics. Uh, and it's been uh, successful. You're eligible for both the primary and the acute care cert national uh, certification exam. And it gives you a little bit of flexibility um, depending on where you go or what job you're in. And if you want to transition, you're pretty much covered either way um, in regards to if you want to do outpatient versus inpatient care. And then probably our second most popular is our acute care PNP. Uh, CNS uh, dual. And like Mark was saying, you do have to do in any of our PEDS and adult dual programs, you do have to do summer hours. And for the CNS, they have to do 500 hours in between the first and the second year. For the dual primary and acute PNP, they do 280 hours in the summer between their first and second year. But it's a twofer for the price of one. And there's a lot of other schools and programs that don't do that. And you have to, if you want a CNS, you have to go extra and pay extra for it. So I think that's one of the really big bonuses or positive things that we offer here at UCLA uh, for students. Most of our um, students will uh, go into jobs or positions depending on uh, if they go primary or acute. Uh, a lot of our graduates just got hired in PICUs in cardiac ICUs, in the emergency room, in palliative care, in uh, pain services, and other subspecialty clinics of pulmonary, neurology, urology. Um, we have students everywhere at the local uh, primary care offices in the community, as well as the local um, pediatric hospitals uh, in the area and in Southern California. And we definitely have a lot within a 30 mile radius here. Um, for pediatrics, you're covered from newborns to age 21 and to practice. And that number can go up to age 23 if you're transitioning a child to adult care who has a chronic disease or special needs. And that's typically what's covered um, for age ranges there. I do want to just give you a couple of tips in the um, application process in that uh, if you don't have any PEDS working experience, um, it's important that you get that if you're interested in applying for the pediatric advanced practice tracks. Um, we can't teach you how to be a pediatric nurse. We hope that you're coming in with that experience already so we can build upon that so uh, you can establish the role as the provider. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Um, oh, and like Mark had mentioned, um, it's really difficult to work full time in this program. So we can talk about that in the question and answer uh, portion afterwards. 
but um, for those of you that think you want to apply for the acute care PEDS uh, tracks, um, if your work or your previous work history is in a PEDS general uh, acute floor, um, don't think that that doesn't prohibit you. It's not having just ICU experience. Most of the general acute care floors, their acuity is quite high, so you can still apply for acute care PEDS. And we'll answer any questions afterwards. Thank you so much, and we look forward to reading your applications. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Pike. And so now I would like to introduce Dr. John Lazar, who's going to talk about our family nurse practitioner specialty. Hi, everybody. I like to welcome you to the meeting. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the family nurse practitioner uh, specialty at UCLA. The roots of this specialty going back to the late 1980s and since then is getting stronger and stronger every year and we're really progressing to the right direction. The family nurse practitioner will cover the whole lifespan. So basically you're starting with babies and you're going to the end of the life. So with this program, if you're selecting the family nurse practitioner, you will be licensed to treat almost everybody through the lifespan. So give you the flexibility to working in different clinical sites and you getting the training kind of provide you this support to passing through the family nurse practitioner program you really need to have minimum 79 units as you're progressing through the program and uh, when you go to the program you will do 720 hours clinical hours so what is really scheduled through the different quarters uh, in the first year in the winter and the uh, spring quarter you go for one day clinical and when you're coming to the second year you do two days clinical in the fall and the winter and three days clinical in the spring. Mainly you will go to family uh, practice sites, outpatient, where you're getting the basic ideas, how you will treating common diseases, what can happen in family practice. Also, you will receiving a rotation in women's health and you receiving a rotation in pediatrics. So you will be a little bit familiar with that part because you will treating that kind of patients also in family practice. Uh, just to concluding the whole thing, the family practice, the family nurse practitioner specialty is a good choice if you're looking for variety. You want to leave your doors open to any kind of patients and you like to see that you are able to jump in anywhere. So give you more flexibility if you're looking for flexibility. If you're looking for special age groups, you can select, of course, that age group. This uh, leave the door open for you. So as kind of maybe you will say, no, I don't want to see adults anymore because they are boring or I having trouble with them. You're switching to pediatrics and you see pediatric patients. So the, the, you will have a flexibility to making changes and kind of that can give you the opportunity that you can always adjust and always you can go to the direction what you really like. And again, I'd like to welcome you one more time to this meeting. We're looking forward to see your application in the future. And hopefully maybe I will see some of you in the school in uh, 2022. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so um, we would like to open this up for questions. Um, so please, you guys, if you have any questions for our faculty here, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, and we can go ahead and answer those for you. So please don't be shy. If, any questions you have, we would love to answer those for you. Um, our faculty do have a few. While we're waiting for questions to start coming in, uh, just to add, you know, a little bit more information on the uh, application uh, process. Um, obviously, um, we want to see what you're doing other than all being excellent uh, nurses at the bedside. We want to see, please give yourself credit for everything that you're doing on your application and on your CV. 
for um, committee work that you're doing in the hospital or QI projects that you're doing or you have done or that you've been a part of and any poster presentations or education that you're providing for the nurses in your unit, as well as any other language that, that you might speak that might be beneficial um, for us to know, um, adding those uh, things in there, any certifications that you have as well too. Are you a certified uh, public health nurse or a certified pediatric nurse um, or a certified critical care nurse. So give yourself credit for all these uh, things that you do and let us know in your application. Thank you. And so um, some people are, are asking questions in the chat. So again, please put it in the Q&A section. Um, that way we can all see it. But I will start off with the two questions that were in the chat. So I'll go ahead and say those out loud for you guys to answer. Um, but this one is pertaining to the FMP. Um, so it says, will there be any opportunities for community outreach while being part of the FMP program? I can respond to you. Uh, everything is changed with the COVID-19 pandemic. So everything is went to the kind of different directions. It will be always opportunity. And every year we go for these events when we providing free care to participants. It's during this COVID-19 period, this didn't happen, but usually happening once or twice a year. And we always recruiting MP students who go with the faculty and they provide different levels of care. So we participating on it and this, and I hope that we go back to pre-COVID a way that uh, these events will popping up again and we will be able to participate. Thank you, Dr. Lazar. And there is one more question that's pertaining to the FEP specialty. Sure. Uh, this person is asking if they are interested in ED. So they want to assume that the FMP will be the specialty for them. You know, with the ED is really kind of totally different. If you really want to work in the ED, you need to go to acute care because they focusing on ED. Uh, if you finishing up the family nurse practitioners, you can have different ways to working in the ED. After you finish up the family nurse practitioner, you will be able to work in urgent care. That's, that's usually not a problem. If you want to work in ED, you need to take a post-certificate course, but this can be done in a few months, offered by a special organization where you can get the certification and kind of they train you and probably you will be ready to work maybe in a step down part of the ED, not like a really, really ED part, because for that one, you need to go to acute care. And maybe later as they train you, as you're getting into the ED, you can do it, but probably kind of you, you can get it after kind of you graduating from the FMP program. If you really want to focus on ED, that's your dream and you don't, you don't want to do anything else. My advice, maybe just apply to the acute care program because over there they train you for the procedures. You can do different rotations in the hospital and probably you will be better trained to working in the ED and you can work every, any part of the ED, not just in certain parts. So maybe you need to make the decision what you want to do. Or maybe if you want to just try out FMP for a few years, the door is there that you can go back to the ED with the post-certification kind of program and you can get in a few months, you can get your certification and you should be able to work in ED. Thank you. And so this next question kind of piggybacks off of that, but I think any of the of you three faculty members can, can answer this. Uh, someone is, is talking about the FMP um, in terms of not having experience. Um, and so actually, let me just preface this. If someone wants to apply to your specialty but does not have specific uh, experience in that, can they apply or do you recommend that they apply? Okay, so like, you know, I can say on my part on the FMP, FMP, if you're working as a registered nurse in any kind of floor, you, that will prepare you for the FMP. FMP doesn't require special training and you getting the additional training as you getting into the program. It's probably helpful if you have some kind of nursing experience, you're assessing patients, you're getting used to how it's flowing. It really doesn't require special 
kind of preparation before you getting into certain specialties like pediatrics and acute care, probably they will looking for something that is more close to the specialty and you are prepared before you come in and you are able to flowing in easier as you don't have any experience. And I think probably I, I mentioned earlier, definitely with pediatrics, um, it would be extremely hard for you to uh, come in all your RN experience as adults, and then all of a sudden you want to be a advanced practice provider taking care of kids. You can kind of see that disconnect there. It's a little bit different for um, a lot of the adult uh, specialties here, but for peds, it's just a little bit uh, different in regards to that. I do want to piggyback a little bit on uh, Dr. Lazar's comment um, about the emergency room. Uh, definitely, um, a lot of it depends on the acuity of the patient. Um, when you have that patient who is unstable, um, then your FNP doesn't really cover you for that because you weren't trained in that uh, realm of care. So the adult GERO acute care track, if you really want to be managing those sick patients that come through that are unstable in the emergency room, yes. Um, but that doesn't, the adult GERO acute care does not cover you to see unstable pediatric patients in the emergency room. So oftentimes that would require a post-master's acute care um, certification that you can do afterwards so that you can see sick, you know, uh, pediatric patients uh, that come through the emergency room. Thank you. And Dr. Pike, um, or even Dr. Robbins, or even Dr. Lazar, would you guys want to speak a little bit briefly about the acute care program? We do have someone that's interested in that, uh, but we don't I have any like standing faculty yeah, like, right you now. Know, I, can, I can talk a little bit about acute care. Acute care is basically they focusing in patient, mainly in patient care, and they focusing on uh, sometimes critically ill patients. And usually what just Dr. Pike has mentioned, usually acute care is looking for strong inpatient experience, ICU kind of step down ICU, something that is exposed to you, that kind of uh, procedures and treatments what you're facing in acute care. Acute care, mainly you will go to inpatient settings or specialties where you're learning different kind of uh, systems and you treating critically ill patients many times. And it's the main focus that you kind of focusing on mainly in patients. Many times acute care nurse practitioners working with the physician and they making runs in the office after they leaving the hospital. But many times they will taking runs in the hospital just like a physician. So they making the runs uh, you know, around what, where, where are the patients. So it's we require a different kind of preparation and you getting in the acute care you getting an extra procedure, physical assessment class, where they train you for the procedures, how you can put the chest tube in, how you can intubate, how you can do some special skills, what is not included in every specialty. And uh, what I just said, after you rotating through the same kind of principles that you do certain hours every quarter, and you focusing on acute ill patients. And that's separating you a little bit from the primary care section. Thank you for that. And I see some questions coming in. Oh, here's a good one. Um, can someone explain the difference between a CNS and a DMP? <laughs> Okay, so like, you know, this is almost you comparing something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. really totally, kind of, totally so the different. CNS and DMP is totally this. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. the DMP is a final doctoral degree for kind of nursing. And the DMP is a doctor of nursing practice. 
basically, when you have your master's degree in nursing, you can go back to get your DMP. UCLA School of Nursing has a DMP program. The program is two years long and you're working on a project. You're implementing a project and you need to understand in the nursing education and at the doctoral level, we have two different degrees, the DMP and the PhD. The PhD students will do independent research. They identifying a problem, but nobody touched before and they try to find a solution and they have much, much longer time because it's time consuming. The DMP students identifying the problem and they find a solution what somebody else used already. And they try to bring the solution to their clinical practice, almost like a change project, almost like a quality improvement project. They want to introduce something new, but they don't come up with the original idea. They're copying something that worked before, and they're following evidence-based practice guidelines. The CNS is a, is a degree that you go to school and you go through, you're getting your master's degree and they teach you how you can work in patient mainly. So usually the CNS is working in floors, focusing on education, but it's really not like a doctoral degree, kind of you're getting a master's degree and after kind of you focusing on the teaching part mainly, that will be your main focus as you functioning after graduation. So it's a totally two different ways and one is going right, one is going to the left. It's, you can compare them because it's a totally different kind of uh, items. It's really not the same. Thank you, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, so we have a question here. It says for adult juror acute care program, is the dual CNS slash NP program similar to the PEDS program? Yes, I can, yeah. I can see that. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Pike. Oh, I was, I mean, I was just going to say that with um, the CNS as part of a dual, whether it's acute care or whether it's pediatrics, um, they do take the same additional coursework. There are two additional classes that they take. There's a theory class uh, for clinical nurse specialists, as well as a quality improvement course that uh, whether you're adult or pediatrics, you, uh, you have to take those. And uh, you're all doing the same uh, summer CNS hours, but you're in your specialty area. The ped students will be in pediatric units, whereas the um, adult GERO acute care students will be in various adult um, units uh, where they'll be doing their hours, but you will be together for certain CNS classes, um, as well as seminars uh, for the summer hours that you will be doing. And part of the CNS role is uh, doing a, a unit-based project, and you'll be doing that with your preceptor during those summer hours. It's a lot of hours. It's 500 hours to do, but you'll be expected to do a project uh, during that time with your preceptor or other resources that are in that unit for you to do, and uh, you will be presenting your poster. Um, typically, most of the CNS students will present their poster at the School of Nursing Research Day, which is typically in early May every year. Thank you. And so we have, I think, maybe another minute, a couple minutes um, for our faculty here before they have to go. So if you guys have any, have any more questions, um, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. If not, I can leave it to you three if you wanna do any quick closing remarks. Um, what I also always like to ask is if it's okay for these prospective applicants to email you um, if they do have any questions. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yes. Awesome, so you guys hear that. So again, we'll continue on through the information session, but I know some questions may pop up at the end. And so always feel free to direct those to myself, or you could direct it to these three amazing faculty members who took time out of their day 
So again, I just wanna say thank you on behalf of the A team, as well as the prospective applicants that are out here joining us today. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. Have a good uh, rest of your day and we look forward to seeing your applications. Awesome, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, great. So let's go ahead and continue on with the application process. And so, let's see here. Okay, here we go. So um, for those that may be familiar with um, how the UCLA graduate admissions works, um, our application typically opens up every year after Labor Day. And so if you had gone onto the website, maybe even started the application, um, I will say that it is um, two, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Got to figure that out, thank you. Um, okay, so for those that applied or are thinking about applying to start your application, um, please hold off. I do also believe that Graduate Division even took down the old application. So again, if you guys had started working on that, hold off a little bit um, because the new application is not gonna open up until after Labor Day, okay? And so um, we typically think, I mean, Labor Day typically for us falls on our holidays on a Monday. Um, so the application probably will open up later that week, either Thursday or Friday, okay? Um, but to get to it, you're going to want to go to grad.ucla.edu. Um, so here, um, oh, let me back up. So for plans for graduate study, there are three application types. There is new, readmission, and renewal. And then for the major um, slash program, you want to make sure that you're selecting nursing, MSN, APRN. We do have other graduate programs. So uh, when you're going onto the application, you will see that it says uh, nursing, MSN, MECN. You'll see one that says nursing, PhD, and you'll see one that says nursing, DMP. So you want to make sure that you are selecting the correct major and program. If you do select the wrong one, it will take you to a different part of the application. So again, you want to make sure that you're selecting MSN, APRN program. Again, these are the nursing specializations. And so as you go into the application, this is what it's gonna look like. And these are gonna be the different types of specialties that you'll be able to apply to. So remember, you can only apply to one. So there's no options to apply to two different specialties. Okay, so when you're in an application, you will have to submit um, an academic history and transcripts. And so when you're doing that in chronological order, it's gonna ask for you to list your highest education, okay? So here you're only gonna put your four years, four year institutions because that's only what's gonna be able to populate. Um, I believe there's a drop, drop down menu and you'll be able to start typing in your institution. So it does not have any uh, two year community colleges there. So at this point, you're only gonna enter the four year universities and you'll put your highest degree, highest degree going down all the way to your bachelor's. So also in this section, you'll be able to upload your unofficial transcripts. And so with this, uh, we will be asking for you to submit your unofficial transcripts from your um, undergraduate degree. So again, if you um, completed your BSN, you're going to submit it there. Um, if you even have another undergraduate degree before you went back for maybe an accelerated BSN, you'll also upload that. But we're also going to ask you to upload, again, your community college, right? So you're not going to list it um, here, right? But you will be able to upload the unofficial transcript. So we do need that. And do note if admitted, um, so later on, you'll find out if you're admitted. And in that case, then we're gonna ask for you to submit official transcripts. So for now, during the application process, you'll be able to submit unofficials, but then if admitted, you'll be able to submit official transcripts and that will be able to complete your admissions. Um, okay, so what we're looking for in terms of an applicant, um, is gonna be for you to submit two different types of essays. One is gonna be your statement of purpose. One's gonna be your personal statement. But in this, we want you to talk about or give us a clear assessment of your potential goals for graduate studies, um, as well as advancing, right? And picking that right specialization. You're also gonna to wanna to talk about and give reasons for why you're selecting UCLA. So what is it about UCLA that's gonna help you as you move forward to maintaining, um, or I should say, obtaining your goals? Um, with that, we want you to clearly state your goals and we want you to demonstrate an understanding of an advanced practice role, All right? So I know that's a little bit of what our faculty were talking about. Um, so you really wanna make sure that through your, your uh, experience as an RN that you do know what the advanced practice role is. We also want you to talk about any clinical experience that you have, 
again, and how it's related to any of the specialties that you're interested in. We want you to talk about any leadership activities and the different qualities that you have. And we want you to talk about how you feel that's also helpful. We want you to include your multicultural experience as well as your diversity experience. And we also want to see if, if um, you have the ability to respond to challenges, right, or adversity. Again, you guys are, you know, mostly all BSN prepared and are also working, you know, as registered nurses right now. So as you know, right, speaking of challenges, you're going to be thinking about the pandemic that's been going on for the past year and a half, right? And so we want you to kind of talk about that, on how you responded to other things of your life in terms of challenges or adversity, if it's social, economical, um, right? If you're thinking other disadvantages like being first generation, then you want to talk about how you're able to overcome those. Also talk about um, any type of bilingual ability, multilingual ability that you have. Um, as you know, here in Los Angeles and at UCLA, there's so many different languages being spoken. So that is a plus. Okay, so for the statement of purpose, um, it's gonna be 500 words, which is gonna be about a one page, single space. And in that, um, we're gonna want you to go here, here we go. We're gonna want you to answer any of these five questions, okay? So um, you, again, you do not have to answer all five, but you will have to answer some of those. And so I always say, choose um, the questions that you feel will best be able to describe who you are and why you wanna to apply to the program. Next, for the personal statement, um, this is not gonna be the same in, in terms of the statement of purpose, so you do not wanna duplicate your answers. But in this, we want you to describe um, your background, right? your accomplishments, any life experiences, that again has led you to applying to a graduate degree. Again, this is where you could talk about the diversity and the challenges that you've gone through, but at the same time, you can also talk about the contributions that you have to diversity, right? And how you feel through education, public services, or anything that you feel um, you wanna talk about that does um, talk about the diverse population that you may be serving in terms of your own communities and so forth. And so with this, it's also gonna be one page, uh, single space, and it will be about 500 words as well. I do see someone did ask, um, are we on rolling admissions? So we are not, okay? So again, with the application open up after Labor Day, uh, we have one deadline um, and that's gonna be for fall 2022. Um, so we do not um, look at applications. Once the application opens up, we wait until after the deadline before we start our process of going through applications. So that is a good question. So we'll move forward with the resume, obviously, you guys all know how to put a resume together, um, but it's not going to be like your typical work resume where you're going to have to submit one page. You can submit multiple pages. Typically, people um, submit about two pages worth. But in that, we want you to highlight your educational honors, work experience, volunteer experience, um, and any of your other professional organizations or associations that you belong in. We would also like for you to put in a chronological order. And if you like, you can make bullet points, right? So talking about the different type of work experience that you have, um, what you've been doing, and, and kind of giving an outline in terms of what our faculty can see in terms of what you're doing. For letters of recommendations, we will ask for three. And one um, thing that we're gonna ask for is that if you can choose one of your recommenders to be a current employer, right? So if you're thinking like your nurse manager, we would like that. If there's anyone that maybe has transitioned to a new hospital or creating a new job, um, and if you don't feel too comfortable with your current employer, right? Just because you just started working there, you can use a past employer. Um, but we are looking for at least uh, a nurse manager, okay? If you can, limit, limit it to one physician. Um, a lot of times people like to use physicians. And so in the past, um, and now we're saying, please limit to at least one. Also, make sure that you're not using any coworkers, right? So anyone that has a lot of opposition to you. And of course, last but not least, you wanna make sure that there's no family or friends. So speaking a little bit about the letter of recommendations, um, we do have a grid form, okay? So as you go into the application, you're gonna submit um, the names of your recommenders as well as your email address. And then what they'll do is they'll receive um, in a, a, a link um, that will direct them to uh, the application. Um, I'm sorry, the recommendation application, I guess you could say. And with that, they'll be able to submit um, answers in terms of the type of questions that we have. It's like a grid form, so it's like check marks. Um, but there are two questions uh, that they'll be able to type in answers. And so with that, um, they'll be able to submit it. And then there's also an opportunity for them to upload a letter as well. Okay, 
So let's move on to the supplemental prerequisites. So remember, we do have four prerequisites that we are going to be asking. And so um, there are going to be two that have a time limit. Okay, so human physiology does have to be completed within the last five years. And then if you go down to the last bullet, it's going to be physical assessment, which has to be completed within the last three years. And then the next two do not have a time limit, but it will be a nursing research and a statistics course or biostatistics. Do know that you can still apply if you don't have any of these prerequisites completed um, in that knowing that if admitted to the program, you will have to complete them before you start. Typically, um, as undergraduates, you should have a nursing research course and you should have a statistics course. But again, because physical assessment and human physiology do have a time limit, uh, we do offer those here in the UCLA School of Nursing for our medicine students to complete uh, during the summer before they start the program in the fall. So again, if you do not have any of these prerequisites, you can still apply and be admitted into the program. In terms of the prerequisites, uh, we're asking that you complete them with this year better. And if you have any questions in terms of seeing if the prerequisites that you completed at your current school are approved or not, you could go to our website and we have a list of all of our approved courses and a list of all the different universities and colleges that we accept them from. I know a couple people are asking about the um, requirement of completing the BSN or having an RN license. And so, yes, we are requiring that applicants have a California RN license at the time of application. And so we are giving you until January 15th to submit proof of that. For those that may be international applicants, you will have to take the TOEFL exam if English was not the primary language spoken. Um, but there are some, well, there's exceptions and then there's non-exceptions, I should say. And so a lot of people have questions maybe for those that have completed a degree, um, like from the Philippines, unfortunately, the university is still requiring those to complete the TOEFL exam. So you have the option of taking the TOEFL or the IELTS, okay? And if you are thinking about applying and you're gonna have to take the TOEFL or IELTS, our institution code is 4837. And then our intended graduate major code is gonna be 0610. Okay, so last but not least, we'd want to make sure that you guys know about our application deadlines. So again, you're going to submit the application um, starting after Labor Day, which you'll have until December 1st to submit. So again, it's not rolling admissions, it's not first come first serve, so take your time with it. You can start the application, you can save and continue, save and exit, but just make sure that you're submitting it before uh, the deadline. So again, it's going to be on a Wednesday, December 1st, and it's by midnight. Okay, so we just want to make sure you submit it before the second. Uh, do know that the application is on Eastern Standard Time. Um, so for instance, if you submit your application, you know, you're going all the way to the last minute and you want to make sure everything is perfect. And for some reason you submit it, let's say at like 11 p.m., the submission date will probably say 2 a.m. on December 2nd. Don't be alarmed. Um, we do know that you still submitted it uh, by the deadline, which is December 1st. And then also um, our supporting documents, we want to make sure that you submit those by January 15th. And so what do you, when you're thinking supporting documents, that can be your letters of recommendations. So your recommenders actually have until January 15th to submit. Um, other supporting documents can be submitting your California RN license um, or even any transcripts that may be missing. So again, as you submit your application, myself, Jamie and Natalie, we will reach out to you to say thank you for applying. Um, your application is complete and or something is missing at that time. Okay, so let's open it up for some questions. I think we do have some time here before um, Leone jumps in and talks about our financial aid. Okay, so I do see a question here. What a letter recommendation. Um, oh, if it comes from a charge nurse, is that also okay? Yes. So in the past, we've had applicants who submit um, or use a letter recommendation from a charge nurse. So yes, that is a great question. And we do accept that. All right, so please feel free to ask questions. We do have some time before our next phase. Great question. When can we find out if we are accepted? So um, typically, 
Um, our goal is to have our mission decisions sent out by the end of March. Okay, so it does take a little while to give a breakdown in terms of how it works, right? So your application is gonna be submitted by December 1st. And then what we do, the A team, so right, Jamie and Natalie, what we do and myself, we spend the next month and a half going through the applications, making sure that everything is submitted um, and that everything um, is ready to go for our faculty, right? So that goes to about January 15th. And so from the month of January and February, that's when we send it out to our faculty for review. So we give our faculty about a month and a half, almost two months um, to go through that process. And then the mission decisions are made. Um, and then that's when our, we're gonna be able to send out our missions acceptance letters. So we always say end of March, um, but to be honest, our goal is to make sure that students can receive that in the beginning of March. Okay, so you will definitely find out in the month of March. Okay, so how current do letters of recommendations have to be? So for instance, a uh, manager from several years prior. So um, it's a good question. Uh, if you're thinking about a manager, again, we want one to be current, so that's okay. But if you also wanna use a past manager uh, from several years prior, that's okay as well. But one of the main things is making sure that one of your managers is um, someone that's current. So great question. Another great question, are all parts of the application weighted evenly? I wouldn't say evenly, but I would say that different parts of the applications all have a point scale. So I can give a quick breakdown of the point scale in a sense. Um, and so you can get points for your uh, GPA. You'll get points for your uh, prerequisites. And then you'll get points for different parts of the application, right? So there's points for your resume. Um, there's points for the statement of purpose, personal statement, as well as the letters of recommendations. And then there's different things that we do look for in the application, right? So, you know, the amount of work experience that you have, the different type of volunteer experience that you have, um, even if you have any type of research experience, okay? You get points, again, if you're bilingual, if you get points for if you have diversity, leadership. So pretty much everything we kind of stated in terms of what you can include in the essays, those are the different point scales that you could receive. Um, I will say that probably mostly all of the applicants are not going to be receiving all the points and it's just kind of the way it's built right and so that's not something to be alarmed about but just knowing that um, you want to have and or submit a competitive application and just trying to, to knock off you know as many points as possible in terms of you know what makes you um, a strong applicant and an applicant who wants to apply to a program. Okay, another good question. What is the acceptance rate? And so it's tough. Um, I can tell you from this past year, um, for acute care, we had 55 applications and we made it 40. For FNP, we also have 55 um, applications, they made it 40. For pediatrics, I believe we had 22 applications and we admitted 17. And then for, what's next? Of the adult general primary and occupational health, we have, uh, I believe we received nine applications and we admitted eight. Uh, but again, those were those that we admitted, but then we had some that declined our admissions and so forth. Um, but so acceptance rate um, kind of alludes to the competitiveness um, so yes, the applications are competitive, but just numbers wise, our goal is just to make sure that we can select the best students that we can. <laughs> ah, great question. Yes, so this, so this uh, information session is being recorded and we will be putting it on our website. Um, so those that wanna revert back to it, they can. So definitely we'll make sure that we do that but someone is asking about the IELTS code. And so let me back up for that so you can see it. There you go. Okay, someone is asking, um, yes, I mentioned earlier. So if someone received a BS from a four-year degree and then went back and did a BSN, um, 
Okay, what GPA basically will we be looking at? Okay, so good question. So again, for those that have two degrees, right? So you have a BS or a BA, right? And another discipline. Um, so that most likely is gonna be your first degree. Uh, we will look at that, right? So you're gonna have to submit your transcript. You're gonna have to also input that information in the application. And then you're also gonna have to do the same for your BSA. So in the School of Nursing, we are gonna look at your BSN GPA, all right? And so we're gonna determine that to, to, to use in terms of the application process to see how competitive you are. Um, but the university will be looking at your first degree, right? But here in the School of Nursing, we are the ones that make the decisions. So for any reason, if your GPA from your first degree is under 3.0, uh, what we do is we write a justification to UCLA Graduate Division saying that for us, we look at the BSN degree and that you're competitive that way and so forth, okay? But again, we do look at both GPAs, but in terms of the school of nursing, in terms of the application, it will be your BSN. So hopefully I clarified that for you. Do we have to retake, retake prerequisites that were taken prior to 2017? Correct. So for human physiology, if you completed it, um, outside of the 2017 to 2022 timeframe, you, you will have to take it again. Same for physical assessment, right? So human physiology has a five-year time limit and physical assessment has a three-year time limit. So again, we do double check when, when students submit the application. We do go through the transcripts to verify that someone has completed it on time. And if you had it, then we make a note of it. And if admitted to the program, we notify you uh, that you will have to complete it before starting the program in the fall. Another good question. So uh, if a class is in person, how large will the class size be? So typically you will move in a class size um, with your cohort, okay? Um, again, if it's kind of like a general course that may be overlapping with acute care and peds, then you might be taking a class together, right? Or if it's family, um, you know, with the occupational environmental health, then that can be something that you'll be taking again. Uh, but typically you'll be moving in together with your cohort. All right, uh, will you take the ADN GPA into consideration? Unfortunately, we do not um, in terms of the emissions. Uh, we do want to see that, that transcript, um, of course, but in terms of like the point scales, the points does come from your undergraduate degree, okay, not the ADN. So that is a great question. All right, here's another one. Um, is there any benefit in the workforce to applying to a DMP program over an APRN program, regardless uh, of working bedside? Um, that's difficult to answer. I'm not sure if you guys know, but there's been talk for many, many years now that uh, you know the different states have been wanting people to transition to a DMP, right? And so, um, and also saying, you know, at, at, at some point they would want APRNs to get their DMP. So. Uh, is there benefits? It depends where you want to work. Um, there's going to be a lot of students who graduate every year. We're going through students that graduate every year through our program that are able to sign, that are able to find jobs as advanced practice nurses that don't have to receive their DMP. So again, I think it's going to be up to you as a personal choice in terms of how far you want to go in terms of your degree. But again, our APRNs are able to work bedside if they want to start their own clinical practice or whatever the case is. And if you have more questions about DMP, um, I would definitely recommend um, you can contact me. And then what I can do is I can forward you to our partner who works specifically in the DMP program. So I can help you with that. Okay, for human physiology and physical assessment, do lab portions also have to be repeated? No, that is a great question. Um, well, let me back up. Human physiology, uh, we do not require the lab, but for physical assessment, a lab is required. And if you're thinking about retaking those, again, you can take those at UCLA. And we offer both of those during our summer sessions. Okay. So I do see our partner, Leonie Thomas is here. So we'll go ahead and move forward. And I just wanna say for those that may have questions, please uh, feel free to contact um, Jamie, myself, or even Natalie. So take a screenshot if you can and you'll go ahead and see um, our emails listed here, okay? If not, they're on our website. Um, so there's plenty of ways to find us. 
uh, but we are going to be the ones in terms or, or in charge of processing applications. Uh, last but not least, don't worry about sending your transcripts now because this is once you're admitted to the program, we accept electronic officials and are of course those sent through the mail. And we always want to put this disclaimer here um, because if we could, we would love to admit you know, each student, but just numbers wise, just because we can only admit a certain amount, what we do is we try to give us our best um, advice for you guys and guidance to make sure that you're submitting a competitive application. Okay, um, I think you guys coming to this info session is the first step in doing that. Okay, all right. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our new director of financial aid, Leone Thomas. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Mark. Hey, everyone. As uh, Mark introduced, I'm Leonie Thomas, the Director of Financial Aid at the School of Nursing. Um, welcome to today's open house. You've you know, learned about the curriculum, the admissions process, and now we get to our segment on graduate financial aid. Of course, uh, the big question is, how am I going to pay for all of this? So I wanted to start by just reviewing our fees. So as you can see, our current in-state fees are 25,831 per academic year. Uh, you do pay fees quarterly. So because we have three main quarters in the academic year, the fall, winter, and spring, we divide that by three. So per quarter, you can, you can expect your tuition and fees to be around $8,610. Now it's not unit based. So no matter how many units you enroll in, you pay that same fee. Um, the total projected budget. So you see another number there. It's quite a bit higher. It's 59,375. So what does that include? So the annual budget or your cost of attendance includes of course your tuition and fees. These are direct costs to the university. Um, so that's the 25,831 we just touched on. But your budget also includes, you know, other expenses that you can expect, such as your um, room and board, books and supplies, transportation, and so forth. So you do have, um, we can award financial aid up, up to your budget, so up to that 59000 um, So you'll see that you'll get financial aid, you know, of course, to cover your tuition and fees, but you'll also be able to get financial aid, you know, for your living expenses up until that annual um, the annual budget. Next slide. Um, financial aid options. So let's talk about kind of what financial aid options we, we can offer. Um, graduate division offers some fellowships. So um, pay, pay attention to that deadline. It is December 1st, 2021. Um, you can find more information about the type of um, grad division um, fellowship opportunities offered on grad.ucla.edu. Uh, you can also fund your education, of course, with loans. So through the FAFSA, you'll uh, qualify for direct unsubsidized loans up to 20,500 per year and graduate plus loans, which can, you know, which you can borrow. There's no really annual limit, but you can just borrow up to the difference of your other financial aid up to that cost of attendance of the 59,000. Um, if you are a California dream applicant, then you can also qualify for a dream loan. It is a $4,000 loan annually. And of course, we have plenty of scholarship money available as well, um, based, you know, scholarships based on both merit and need. And once you're admitted, we'll be sending out scholarship applications. So those are generally sent out early um, next year and with a deadline of May 30th. So next slide, let's touch on deadlines. Um, so deadlines are critical. So first, as I mentioned, our fellowship application deadline is December 1st, 2021. Um, you can apply for most of the graduate development fellowships um, within the online application for admission. So you do that as you apply, but just in case you didn't indicate that you wanna be considered for scholarships in your admissions application, you can also submit a hard copy uh, of the fellowship application for entering graduate students. So you would su just submit that to me or, or to our department um, and we'll pass that on to the graduate division. Now, March 2nd, every year uh, is, the pri uh, is the deadline for applying for financial aid. Um, and this is for priority consideration. So March 2nd, 2022, um, you can apply for the free application for federal student aid. 
for the FAFSA uh, on studentaid.gov. So that's if you are a US citizen or eligible, you know, a permanent resident, um, or else you might qualify for the California DREAM Act, and you can apply on dream.csac.ca.gov. Now, our, um, you do wanna make sure that you submit your application to us. So you can do that by just inserting our school code. It'll ask you for, for that code, it's 001315. Now, if you don't write it down or <laughs> forget it, that's okay. You can also do a search by school. So you would just search UCLA and then that school code should populate. And then as mentioned, so we have scholarship opportunities. So that's our own internal funding. Um, of course, you can always seek external scholarships as well. There's plenty of opportunities uh, for those, but for our um, School of Nursing scholarships, our deadline is going to be you know, typically around May 30th, but when we send out the application, we'll, we'll definitely let you know more details. So I think that's really it. If there are any questions, I can take those now. Um, and otherwise, I can pass it back to Mark. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. And so there has to be some questions out there, you guys, <laughs> especially when it comes to having to pay for, you know, for school. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions that you have now. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up here um, because, Leonie, if it's OK with you, if um, our applicants have any questions, maybe, you know, later on down the line, if they can email you, would, would that be something they, they can do? Absolutely, yeah, if you have any questions, my email is leone, L-E-O-N-I-E, -E, thomas at sonnet.ucla.edu, which you can see there at the top of the screen. So feel free to reach out with any questions at any time. Awesome, okay, so here's a couple of questions that are coming in. Um, are the payment plans options during the quarter? So are there payment yeah. plan options during the quarter? Gotcha. Yeah, there are. So you pay uh, one, so it would be split up. Your balance would be split up quarterly. Um, so once a month, you'd have a payment due. So if you have some financial aid to cover, you know, then your balance, you just have to pay that off the remainder of the quarter. So you would coordinate that with our student accounts office, um, you know, through Bruin Pay. Awesome. And here's actually another good question. Uh, what opportunities are available for current UCLA employees? Yes, great question. So um, UCLA employees and actually any UC employees do qualify for an employee um, tuition discount. So there is a reduced fee of two thirds. So that comes to about um, 8,000 that you would save per academic year. Um, you would, there is a limit of the number of classes you can enroll in. I think it's four courses or 12 units. Um, so you just want to make sure you stay within that limit, whichever is higher. So if your four courses are more than 12 unit, that, units, that's fine. Um, and then you submit, you can send me, you know, your reduced fee form and we'll forward it on to HR. So your tuition discount can be applied. Awesome. Okay. Another question here. Um, someone is asking, and I'll kind of try to paraphrase this um, because we, we offer dual programs. And so someone is asking mm -hmm. if they are doing the, the dual program, would the tuition be the same? And my, I guess with that, and you can elaborate on this, uh, tuition is for the academic year, right? So that, that, that does not include the summer. Right. So I, I believe yeah, that's that what the question is really going towards. Oh, okay. Yeah, enrollment in summer is completely separate. And um, it does actually require a separate financial aid application as well if you enroll in summer so that we can award you. Um, and that's based off of, so summer is a header trailer, a header quarter. So um, let's say you're attending, um, if you were to attend summer this year, it would include, uh, it would be through the 2021-22 financial aid application. Next summer would be 22-23. Um, so you do have to do the next year's FAFSA. Uh, you do want to let us know you're applying and we do offer financial aid in the summer as well. So it would cover your dual program as far as I know. Awesome. And would you be able to name some of the scholarships that are offered? I guess just Ooh, by name. So yeah, someone's asking what kind of scholarships are offered? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have a lot of, you know, Regental and Foundation scholarships. So just to name a few, um, we have um, a Mosley scholarship. Um, I, 
just specific. Um, yeah, I, we have. I, I mean, the, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I mean, um, it's those questions always kind of make me laugh, just because um, <laughs> there, there's tons of scholarships. Uh, one that's coming to mind is PANZA, right? Because I know you and I were talking about that a little yeah. bit earlier. And so PANA, PANZA stands for Pan African Nursing Student Alumni Association, right? So there's so again, if you are part of this organization, student organization, that's an opportunity of receiving scholarships. There's just so many different types of scholarships that are, that we offer, and it was kind of based off what Leonie was saying, based off merit and need. So there's tons, and and after being admitted, um, that typically May 30th deadline. Sometimes that changes a little bit, but that's where she's going to send it out to you guys and. And, and let you know the different type of scholarships that are offered. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for adding that. We do have a ton of different scholarships. Um, I do want to say, though, please do apply for your FAFSA because the, most of them are, you know, based on need. Um, and we do want to take into account, you know, what your need is and merit scholarships uh, as well. So there's a there's a huge range. And I saw a question just come into if you're a UCLA or UC employee. Um, and you have discounted tuition, do you still qualify for scholarships? So yes, we, you would still qualify for scholarships and we advise you to definitely apply. Awesome, thank you. So we have maybe a couple more minutes. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, but again, as you see through our faculty, um, or even Natalie and Jamie and myself, as well as Leone, we are open. So again, if you guys have any questions that come down later on down the line, please feel free to email us. Um, we'll be happy to answer those, set up any Zoom meetings, anything you like, uh, but we're here to help you um, as you are thinking about applying and moving forward. So again, if you didn't have any questions, I just wanted to say thank you, Leone, for taking some time out of your day to give us great insight about our financial aid. Um, and wait, so there's one more before I continue. Okay, so it uh, says for FAFSA, I know that they look at previous year income to determine aid. If we decide not to work during the program or work part-time, how do we apply for aid based off that projected income? That's a great question. And we see that all the time. Of course, now FAFSA is prior, prior year. So your situation might look completely different or you're reducing your hours now that you're going back to school. So we do take that into account. We do have a projected year income petition, which is on um, the financialaid.ucla.edu website. And you can submit that to us with your, you know, what you expect your new income will be for the, for the upcoming year. And then we'll make changes to your eligibility accordingly. Um, and so we'll, we'll take that into account for sure. Awesome. Okay. So. Thank you again. Totally appreciate it. Um, and so if of that's course. it, we'll go ahead and let her go and then we'll go ahead and finish up. Awesome. So All thank right. you, Leonie. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay. So you know what, guys, we are actually done here. And so again, we just want to say thank you. We really hope that this information session really provided you with all the info that you need to start the application, um, you know, and complete it successfully. But again, if you guys have any questions, I'm pretty sure those may come up, especially after the application opens. Um, again, we're gonna be here to serve you with that. Also, if you hadn't seen it or not, um, in the same website where you guys were able to RSVP to the, to the info session, we have what's called general um, application office hours. Uh, so we will be able to meet with you for 15 minutes um, to answer maybe any lingering questions that you guys may have. So again, feel free to take advantage of that. Um, I believe it might be next week or sometime coming up this month. Um, but yeah, whatever the case is, please feel free to do that. We would love to meet you guys again. Um, but with that, we wanna say thank you again. Um, good luck to everyone, and we hope to have your applications coming in soon. Thank you, and go Bruins.